So in my upper left-hand corner, I saw a, a cross, shape of a cross, shining like the sunlight. Every time I look, I would see this cross. And I would ask God one question, one word, why? Then I would hear back, because I love you. And then one time, uh, there was a young lady who was staying with, with one of the sisters, and, and she would get up even before we actually start to pray, go to the bathroom. And it was so annoying uh, that either me or Shin asked, like, what's going on? Like, why are you getting up? And her exact words were this, you won't believe me, but I have three demons in me. And so at the end of the worship, I just told the congregation, how many of you felt like cold wind swirl around you? If you did, that's the demonic activity. And then I comes up after the service. He, he tells me, that cold wind that you describe, it's inside of me. Well, John, thank you so much for making the time. Your testimony is connected to somebody we've shared mm. on our channel already. His name is Ide. He's actually the second or third most mm. viewed testimony on our channel. And so for anybody that's watching right now, you can, you're going to have a link in the description box. Um, if in case you want to check out that testimony that is intertwined even with uh, the testimony that you are going to be watching today. But uh, John, today we're focusing on your uh, uh, love story with Jesus and how Jesus encountered mm -hmm. you and how mm -hmm. he's been able to use you then to be able to lead others to Jesus. And so let's start with your life before. Okay. Um, did you grow up in a Christian home? Did you know about Jesus? Tell us a little bit about that. Right. So I did not grow up in a Christian home, meaning uh, before the age of nine, I had very little interactions with church or anything, you know, Christian my mom did uh, grow up as a Catholic in what's now North Korea. My father grew up as, I would say, a nominal Buddhist. But growing up, we did not attend church, with the exception of maybe a Christmas service here and there. No mention of God or Jesus, uh, just life without religion, life without uh, any kind of churchy kind of experience. The first encounter I had, so to speak, was when I was uh, nine years old and I was watching a black and white TV set. Most of the TVs back then were, were, uh, were black and white. And, and the program I was watching was a Billy Graham crusade in Korea. He was speaking uh, in front of more than a million people at Yoido Plaza. And I, I, and I remember this uh, because he's in Korea. Uh, back then, if you were to uh, think about Korea, you would draw a blank. The closest thing was a TV show called MASH. And so in 73, 74, there was just very little reference to, to Korea, except for those who are older, they, they might know about the Korean War. But there was no Samsung, no Hyundai, no LG, no K-pop, nothing or Korean food, I mean, it was not in anyone's awareness, American awareness. So here I was watching this, fascinated about Korea initially, but then as Billy Graham's message is being translated, and at the end of his sermon, he invited people to receive Jesus. As a nine-year-old, I just did, I just closed my eyes, and I, I, I knew enough to say, Jesus, come into my life. But that's it. So right after that, nothing happened. It's not like I went to church, but I do remember that prayer. Mm. Many, many years after, while I was in the eighth grade, I skipped school. Yeah, I don't recommend this to the young people. Do not skip school. But I used to skip school whenever I felt like it, right? <laughs> because my mom and dad would go to work, and uh, if I didn't feel like going to school, I would just stay home and then you know, write up a fake note that my grandmother died or grandfather died or something oh my terrible goodness. like that. But unfortunately, only got, I only got two sets of grandparents, so after a little while, you run out of grandparents who pass away. So, But anyway, I was uh, skipping school, and I was tired, so I wanted to take a nap, so I turn on the radio, and a preacher comes on the radio program, and he says, Jesus is coming back, and he's going to divide the goats from the sheep. And I knew what that meant enough. I go, oh, no. I got scared, hopped out of bed. Right next to the bed, I prayed to Jesus. I don't want to be goat. <laughs> I want to be sheep. 
I need to go to church. I need to get to know you. That was my prayer. Hmm. And then about two weeks later, my father uh, wanted to talk to me, and he said, John, you don't know who you are. You're Korean, but all your friends are American. You don't know who you are. I want you to go to church, a Korean church. There's a new church opening down the street on Wilson Lane in Bethesda, and we were in Bethesda at this time. And as he's telling me this, I knew immediately God is answering my prayer. Because my father's not religious. He, he was just concerned I was losing my ethnic identity because I was hanging out with non-Asians, non-Koreans. Mm. So his concern was nothing to do with God, everything to do with like being Korean. But as he was telling me this, that wasn't my reason. The reason for my joy, my joy is, oh, no, I'm going to get to know God. Wow. So I started going to church regularly. I enjoyed it in eighth grade, but I still knew Jesus didn't have my complete heart because I remember one session, uh, one of the teachers drew a picture of a chair and the letter E standing for ego and a cross. And she had various versions of this picture. And she said, which picture describes you? And the picture I chose for myself is the E, the ego, myself on the chair, and Jesus under the chair. So even in eighth grade, ninth grade or so, I knew I loved Jesus, trusted Jesus, but even for a teenager, I didn't give my heart fully over to Jesus. I didn't really want to. Hmm. Not until 10th grade. So this is when my life turned upside down. This is summer of 1982. And so I go to a week-long conference. It was called Institute and Basic Youth Conflicts, a terrible name, but, but it was a week-long conference basically for Christian parents to raise up Christian kids in a very strict way. But I was there not because of the youth. I was just kind of there because the, one of the deacons of the church invited me to go. And I enjoyed it. It was a Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday conference all day. And then on Thursday in the evening, this man, Bill Gother, would do a chalk talk and we would sing. And so so Thursday evening comes around and he tells the, the audience, and he, he's not even there live, it's all videotape. Okay? <laughs> Somebody just put in a VHS tape and we're watching it. So he's not even live. And so we all stand up and sing a hymn, Trust and Obey. And after we sing that, I sit down and immediately I look around. And the first thought I have looking around, there were several thousand people in this building, the old Cap Center, Capital Center. And the thought I have is these people, mostly older, older white people, these people are my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the first thought. Then the second thought was a response to what I saw. So on my upper left-hand corner, I saw a, a cross, shape of a cross, shining like the sunlight. Every time I look, I would see this cross. And I would ask God, I would ask Jesus, one question, one word, why? And that, then I would hear back, because I love you. I was saying, why did you die for me? And Jesus was saying, because I love you. Mm -hmm. And this went back and forth, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It just didn't stop. Why? Because I love you. Why? Because I love you. Why? Because I love you. Just went back and forth. And while this is happening, I am crying. And I'm actually getting paralyzed. I can't open my hand. I'm sobbing like crazy. And I'm, I'm, I'm taken home by the deacon, and there were two uh, other young people with me. And I am paralyzed in my hands. I am sobbing. And uh, when I'm taken home from Landover, Maryland to Bethesda, I keep on seeing the cross. I keep on asking why. I keep on hearing because he loves me. So I go to bed, and as I'm in bed, my one side of my body begins to get actually very hot. My left side is burning up. And it's not just light. It's like intensely hot. And I'm thinking, this is a crazy thought. Again, I don't have any spiritual encounters before. I don't even know what language to use. But instantly, I think about an old TV show called uh, you know, it's on like a documentary. It's uh, 
sort of exploring the paranormal. That documentary had something on spontaneous combustion. And so I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to burn to death. <laughs> so I got out of bed, afraid, panicked, went to the bathroom. And so I doused myself with cold water all over my left arm. And it finally cooled down. So then I went back to my room. And then I cried all through the night, playing a song, Jesus' Name Above All Names. It's an old, beautiful song. And I just played that on my tape again and again. And so when I woke up the next morning, it felt like the world turned inside out, upside down. And I began to say to myself, if Jesus is real, everything changes. If Jesus is real, everything changes. So I'm in the 10th grade, and this hunger to figure out what does that mean. If Jesus is real, everything changes. I need to find the answer to that. If Jesus is real, everything changes. How, how, like what things change? And I knew immediately how we think must change, how we think about politics got to change, how we think about life has to change. And so even though I was very young, I was driven by this, I would say, truth question. So I went to the Bethesda Public Library, went to the Christian section, like a theology section, biography, and I just started to check out as many books I, as, I, as I could. And I started reading authors later on, finding out some of these authors are famous, like C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, read a biography of Billy Graham by a man named Marsha Frady and a bunch of other books. So I kept on reading and reading. And then uh, in this biography of Billy Graham, remember when I was a nine-year-old, I saw that crusade. Now I'm reading a biography of this man called the... American Prophet by author Marsha Frady. And as I'm reading it, Billy Graham says, for those who are intellectually curious, Wheaton College, Wheaton College is a great place to go. And at that point, I thought Christian colleges, I thought there were just two, Oral Roberts University and Liberty Baptist College in Lynchburg. I didn't know there was a college, like a liberal arts college, where my questions could be answered. And so I got very curious, and so I applied there. My parents were not happy that I was applying there, but we struck up a deal. If I don't get into such and such school, and I get into Wheaton, I'll go to Wheaton. So I went to Wheaton. Mm. Now, now, John, before you move from there, um, leading up to this moment, as as you're experiencing this, are you, as you're asking these questions internally, and all of these things are coming up. Are you speaking with anybody about them? Is this just you and you're kind of like, man, I need to figure this out on my own? Or were you trying to seek help from other people? Right. So that, that's, that's sort of the sad thing. So there was no one in the church that could really inform me. Again, my parents were not Christians. Right. My dad actually thought I was going a little crazy or getting fanatical. Mm. And so he was actually thinking this is just the phase and so part of my temperament is a little bit addictive. And so I was that way with tennis. If I, I loved tennis as an eighth grader all the way through high school. So I would practice six hours a day and stuff like that. And so my father thought this, he'll just grow out of it. Right. But because I went to a Presbyterian church and the people were not familiar with this kind of strange phenomenon, no one was there to help me. It took me a long time to look back and say, that was the Holy Spirit. Mm. For me, it was just like weird. But the thing I did not deny at all was the love of God. I knew whatever these electricity or heat experiences were, it was really from God. You know, it was really, I felt a lot of love and a lot of peace. Wow. And even through that, um, just to clarify, as you were feeling these physical, even manifestations in your body, it was paired up with love. Oh, yeah. yeah like it yeah. wasn't just heat, yeah, but no, it was... It wasn't heat. It was... It, it, was, it wasn't just the sensation of heat. It was love, too. You know? Wow. So, so I knew it was God. I just didn't know, what, what is this? Right, you know? right. So it was much, much later than I, that I had the framework and the language to say that was the Holy Spirit. Mm. You could call it I was being baptized or being filled or empowered. And so even though I was feeling this, I was not afraid, even though I had this momentary, oh, no, I'm going <laughs> right. to burn to death. 
I was in, in a total panic, panic, you know. Yeah. I felt uh, some safety. Yeah. You know, so I was reading, and, and so I went to Wheaton. And so that side of my personality or, or part of who I am, I would say the more theological, philosophical, intellectual side, got fulfilled in college. But the supernatural continued as well. Um, the supernatural, there's some supernatural stuff or I would call spiritual warfare, demonic stuff, that also occurred in college. Since college, I've always had some uh, encounters, experiences, some seasons sometimes of very intense spiritual activity. It would wax and wane, but the supernatural never completely disappeared. Yeah. You know, and so that's just how things have been with me. Yeah. You know, I don't question why. But it's just that's just my story. Again, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, so I didn't contrast. I didn't say, well, when I grew up as a little kid in such and such church, it's, it's simply the fact that when I encountered Jesus, it was it was pretty intense, pretty powerful, and pretty riveting. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us about that that warfare. Right, because um, yeah. a lot of the times when we come to follow Jesus, sometimes the picture can be painted that everything is great now. You know, you're saved yeah. and everything yeah. is good. In your um, personal experience, going to college, talk to us about what happened next, the questions, the warfare. What happened there? Yeah, so so the warfare had less to do with me directly, uh, but I was involved uh, in warfare, and I'll just paint that for you. And so uh, my closest friend is a man named Shin, and uh, so we were roommates for three years. And Shin is a genuine intercessor, meaning he prays all the time. (laughs) So even as roommates, uh, he would have the upper bunk and I would have the lower. Often there would be many nights where he would be praying all through the night, uh, and I could tell he's praying, you know, bed springs would squeak a bit. And, and so uh, in, the, in the middle of our college years, we, uh, we, we were involved in an all-night prayer meeting. Now, the all-night prayer meeting didn't start out with our intention of being, being in praying folks. And so he and I were praying uh, with uh, two, two sisters right before the library would close on Friday. So the library closed early at Wheaton at 9, and so we said, let's get together at 8.45. At least we have 15 minutes to pray. And so we did that a few times, and then one Friday, one of the sisters said, I'm suicidal. I'm depressed. I'm suicidal. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we knew a 15-minute prayer is not going to do anything. So we decided to to pray longer. So we went to the apartment of one of the sisters and and just being new and, and, and believing in prayer. We just prayed until something changed. And so we prayed for hours and hours that evening. Wow. And all of a sudden, this sister who was struggling with suicidal thoughts is filled with joy to such an extent she's like rolling around on the floor. I mean, it's like... If you didn't know what was happening, you would think she's like hysterical, I've gone crazy. She's laughing, she's rolling around, she's just full of joy. And actually that joy stayed with her for days and days and days. And, and then thereafter, word got out that this little prayer meeting uh, is powerful, that if you want healing, just come to it. <laughs> hmm. And so the all-night prayer meeting came about because of that one night praying for a sister who was suicidal. After that, different people would come, and we would pray for people like with eating disorders. They would get healed and different things. Wow. And then one time, uh, there was a young lady who was staying with, with one of the sisters, and, and we were beginning to pray. We would worship first, and she would get up even before we actually start to pray, go to the bathroom. And it was so annoying uh, that either me or Shin asked, like, what's going on? Like, why are you ke- come getting up? And her exact words were this, you won't believe me, but I have three demons in me. And so we said, well, tell us what happened. And so she told us what happened, that she was in high school. She had friends who were part of a satanic club. This is in Maryland. 
And one of her friends said, hey, uh, if you want to, would you like to be a bride of Satan? We're going to have a ceremony tonight. And she thought this was all a joke. And she said, sure. And so they went to a classroom, darkened the room, put a metal chair in the middle of the room, told her to crawl to the chair. And the moment she touched the leg of the chair, she would become a bride of Satan. And mm -hmm. so up to this point, she's just thinking, this is just a joke. This is just for fun. They turn off the light, she, she got on her fours, crawled to the chair, and as soon as she touched the metal leg, she felt three spirits enter her. And she could see them, she could hear them. Wow. And they befriended her. They say, if you want to be popular, you just listen to our advice. And so she did, and she became a great flatterer of people. She would... She would know how to talk to people, and pretty soon she did become very popular. And at the same time, there was some trouble, you know, skipping school, lying, and so forth. She was becoming too hard to raise. So her mom sent her to where we were, to her aunt in Illinois. Wheaton is in Illinois. So after she told that story, we thought very simply, one, the Bible, people cast out demons. So we said, we're going to cast out the demons right now. <laughs> So in Jesus' name, we would cast it out, and the demons would say things like, we're gone. But, you know, of course, when they say we're gone and they're still there, they're not really gone. And, and was this the first time that you were doing yep, this? first time, and it was really intense. Hmm. Day after day, hour after hour, hours and hours, we would read Psalm 121, and we just couldn't figure out why the demons wouldn't leave in the name of Jesus. This actually went on for two weeks. Wow. Uh, one day I wasn't there. The the noise from the prayer prayer the deliverance prayer was so loud. The neighbor of the apartment called the police, and the police came and and looked at the group. The police officer said, "Well, you know, just in case she's got some men, you know mental health issues, you should take her to the hospital." And so uh, our friends took this young lady to the hospital, checked her out, nothing wrong, and and so. So she was brought back. And to clarify, John, when you, when you talk about the noise, was it that there was noises coming out of her? What oh, exactly? Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the de the demons at this point we didn't know enough to quiet the voice, uh, so there were voices. But she would be supernaturally strong too. So she's sixteen, petite. For example, I would grab one one of her arms and she would like bench press me. I would wow. put my full weight and she would be able to just push me up without any problem and then the noise came from us praying out loud i mean that's you know that's why the neighbors complain yeah and so long story short <laughs> the woman the young the student who was freed from suicidal thoughts was in a class and she heard from her teacher there is a woman named dr rita brown who's going to do some deliverance in this small church in Indiana, like two hours away. When we found out, we thought, you know what, let's drive this young lady two hours to go to Indiana. And, and so we did. And with me sitting in the back seat with this young lady, I'm wrestling her because the demons are physically manifesting. And so it was a long two hours. And so we get to this small Pentecostal church in rural Indiana, and Dr. Rita Brown is there, and I learned a lot from her. So she asked the young lady, tell me your story, and then she said, because you invited them in, you have to cast them out. We didn't know that. We didn't know that there's a certain protocol or sequence. Mm. And so she was led by Dr. Brown to deliver herself from the demons. The first one came up pretty easily, second one with a little bit of struggle, the third one, the strongest one, was so strongly embedded that it was very difficult for this young lady to cast it out. And, and the demons would, would give her pains. She said it's like knives stabbing her stomach, like, like a metal rake going through her intestines. She was in such pain. Wow. But with encouragement, she was able to cast it out. So that was, you know, that was the first exposure. But then thereafter, I don't know how the word got out, People found out that me and our group did deliverance, so then other people would come, and we did pray. And, and so that was the start. You know, that was the start. And some version of this continued when I was in 
seminary and doing youth ministry and when I go overseas. And so if I were to add up all the deliverances I've done or been involved with, I would, I would, I would say it's around, I don't know, 300. Wow. I mean, some are in large groups, you know, like five, six people would be delivered. And I will say this is one ministry I'm not personally that interested in. <laughs> you know, it's like I like the prophetic, but not so much the deliverance. But again, I'm not going to argue with the Lord. I mean, if he wants to use me, I'm I'm glad to be used. Yeah. I, I'm curious to hear your perspective on that because, you know, in today's time, this has been a ministry that it's being highlighted a lot in yeah. media. Yeah. Uh, but I'm interested in your yeah. in your perspective as to you saying that's not something I'm particularly interested in. And obviously, you are obedient to the Lord, like you said, yeah. when He calls you to do it. But why is it that that's not a ministry that you're particularly interested in? You know, there's always uh, one is the counterattack. You know, sometimes when I would go on mission trips and I had our daughters, uh, the spiritual warfare sometimes include physical happenings or accidents it's not it's not all in your head it's not it's not all in the spiritual realm and so people who do this kind of ministry often will get attacked by the enemy you know demons and mm. so one of the more vulnerable ones are babies and so my wife one time said can you stop going to these retreats doing it because you know our girls are getting hurt they're getting into accidents and so that's that's one minor th- minor thing there's always some kind of counterattack backlash wow. so i just i'm a man of peace i don't want conflict <laughs> yeah you know but but even though i don't want conflict that doesn't mean the conflict doesn't occur so that's that's a part uh the, i think the other part is when you're dealing with evil, it's inherently kind of yucky. You know, it's it's like getting your hands dirty. There's nothing really clean about it. Although I'm messy, I'm clean. If you come to my house, you could tell my room is all messy, but all our bathrooms are really clean. <laughs> I like clean hygiene. So when I do the deliverance, there's an element of a messiness. Mm. You know, so those are the negative. But but in all seriousness, uh, I know it's important. So I've never said no to the Lord, but there's just certain things, and I don't even know exactly why. I've never liked like horror movies. I never like being scared. That whole realm of the spooky, spiritual, dark was never an attraction to me. And maybe because of that, I'm not that interested. But uh, I do like the freedom that people right. experience. I like the the after, you know, the outcome of a deliverance. Yeah. You know, but the sometimes the process itself could be a a little bit messy. Mm. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Now you had one of one of the people that you that you helped was actually one of the witnesses that we interviewed, mm-hmm. and his name is Ide. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that and what happened there. Yeah, so that that episode is pretty vivid in my mind. And so our friend I was a non-believer, a faithful. I was I would call him a, a a devoted Buddhist, devoted Buddhist young man. And one Sunday he visited the church, and during worship time I felt cold wind swirling around people. And and my thoughts are not even on I. There are other people there. I mean church folks, but. As we're all worshiping, I felt this unusual cold air moving around people. And so at the end of the worship, I just told the congregation, I want to ask you, how many of you felt like cold wind swirl around you? If you did, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you that that's the demonic activity. Mm. That cold wind is demonic activity. So I just want to pray for that to, to stop so that we could go forward. So. I remember mentioning that very clearly, and then I preached, and then I comes up after the service. He, he tells me, that cold wind that you describe, it's inside of me. It's not outside of me, but it's inside of me. And I understood immediately that he was demonized, that the demons were inside of him. That's why it was swirling on the inside, not on the outside. 
So at that point, I asked them, even though I didn't know him that well, I, I invited him to come to the house. I said, this coming Wednesday, you know, I want you to come to the house uh, and we could talk about th this more. And so that following Wednesday, he came. And this is early spring. He was wearing a hat, gloves. So when he said he felt cold wind, cold, he was like physically cold mm. <laughs> all the time. So he came to the kitchen and, and we decided to, I, I asked him, I gave him a Bible and said, you're going to read the Gospel of John. Let's read one chapter per week and we could, you could come back and we could talk. And so, but when he came to the house, I, I described very briefly what he was experiencing and essentially, I said, I, you know, if you want to be free of this cold wind inside of you, the only person who could help you is Jesus. If you have Jesus in your heart, in your life, he will cast out that cold wind. Would you like to have Jesus in your life? And I didn't know this, but he was prepared. He said, yes. So right in the kitchen, he accepted Jesus. And I said, I want to see you next week. One week later, he's, he's there. He's read a chapter of John. He comes in, and he's still wearing a hat on the glove. And I said, any development, any change, I? And he goes, the cold wind is no longer inside of me. It's on the outside. <laughs> and, and I said, hallelujah. Hmm. I knew the demons came out of him. So I explained, even though the demons came out of you, sometimes they're hang, hang around and try to harass you. And so we prayed some more. And then the following week, I noticed as I opened the door, he's got no hat, no gloves. And I asked him what happened, and he tells me he was in the library. He started feeling warmth from, the, from his foot all the way. For the first time in months and months, his body felt warm. And I told him, that was the Holy Spirit. You're being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And, and you know the rest of the story for my, the lights would come on and off. A lot of strange supernatural things happen around him. You know, noises in his home, his father seeing somebody in the car. You know, etc. And so, I remember that episode, and that's a great story, right? Of, of demons leaving because of Jesus, and so that that's a beautiful story that I I love to tell and remember. That was the beginning of a wonderful relationship, friendship, you know, with I, Man. and it's still ongoing. John, who is Jesus to you? I only have words, right? That's it. <laughs> only have words. And, and so just like it's hard for me to describe, uh, you know, who, who is your mom to you? It's hard to use words to apprehend, fully encapsulate, you know, uh, my, my thoughts of Jesus. Uh, but if I were to use words, that's the only way I could do it. Jesus is number one, real. It goes back to my 10th grade self, if Jesus is real. Everything changes, but everything changes because he is so real. So in my mind, Jesus is not like a religious figure or philosophical concept or somebody I'm supposed to worship. In my life, in my thoughts and feelings, he is as real as you, Eric, as, as my wife, as my kids. He's real. And when I say he's real, his, his feelings, his thoughts, his purpose, his affection, his tenderness, all those are real to me. And so not only does he exist, but his, his, his personality, his character, his thoughts are just as real as, as, as any human being. Mm. You know, so I would start there. And then the wonder of it all is that Jesus is real as God. Everything that's meaningful, every, everything that happens, everything that's created are found in him. All things are made through him and in him. And, and so those thoughts are kind of mind-blowing. And so at the same time, he, even though he's as real as any human being, is. He's, of course, more than any human being. He's more than all humanity put together. But in my day-to-day, -day, I just love the sort of the humility, realness, gentleness, sweetness of Jesus, and sometimes his, uh, his uh, authority. You know, Jesus is more than someone who's tender and soft. Uh, 
he is also scary, not in a bad way, but he is awesome. Mm. And that's the fear of the Lord for me. God is awesome, therefore I bow down. And, and sometimes I feel that way as I'm in Jesus' presence. So this is this whole combination, the whole spectrum, tender and mighty, sweet and strong. He, he captures it all. But on a day-to-day, I just love being loved by Jesus. Mm. And I love being with him. And I think that's why my favorite person in the Bible, I think, is Apostle John. And when I read the letters of John and the Gospel, I, there's a kind of connection with the Apostle John that I have. And I think it's because for John, the Apostle John, the love of Jesus was so sweet and real. And, and, and so I appreciate that too. Hmm. John, for the people who are watching right now who may be relating to some of the symptoms that you have described in other people who you have helped be set free, whether it's the whirlwind, the cold wind, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whether it's the depression, mm-hmm. the suicidal thoughts. Yeah, yeah. For that person who's watching right now, what is a word of encouragement that you can give them to help them overcome? Right. So, so I tend to think of two groups of people in this related to this topic. And so if you're a Christian and you have some demonic interference, there are certain signs. And one of the signs are that it's difficult to worship, it's difficult to pray, it's difficult to even read God's Word. And so sometimes when I'm preaching and I, I, I can see people are demonized, they'll fall asleep during my sermon. And it's not because my sermons are boring. It could, it could be. <laughs> but often when it comes to spiritual things, the demons would try to make the believer dizzy, not interested, sleepy, irritated, confused. Mm-hmm. So these are all possible signs. Now, these are interesting because when they're doing anything else, like cooking, doing sports, watching TV, they're like fully alert and happy. But when it comes to anything spiritual, all of a sudden they lose interest. So the, that, those, are, those could be a sign. Along with uh, these physical signs of coldness or pain or voices. Uh, and, and so there are set of symptoms for, for believers. And basically, when you're trying to get close to God for whatever reason, there seems to be an obstacle, a barrier, or sort of a numbness. You can't quite feel God and you feel a little numb, disconnected. So these are possible sign. I'm not saying each and every time you have this, you have a demon, uh, but you may, uh, these, these signs may indicate a demon. For those who are willing to do this, uh, I would encourage uh, folks to come before the Lord and, and, and just say to the Lord, Lord, if there's a demon in me, please show me whether there is a demon. Or you could even address yourself. If there is a demon, I command you to leave. But before you pray that leaving, think about how you've been living. The demons do not just come and go. They don't, it's not, they're not in like a revolving door. And so think about how your life is going. And if you're caught in some kind of habitual sin, sometimes that invites the demonic. Sometimes there is trauma that invites the demonic. Sometimes when there's a lot of unforgiveness and anger, that invites the demonic. Do a little inventory of what's been happening and where there's bitterness, unforgiveness. These could be access, you know, openings for the demonic. Now, for non-believers, the only way to be set free is to have Jesus. I think the demonic activity just goes hand in hand with living in darkness, just like I. That's natural for the non-believer to be in the current of the demonic. It's just normal. That's what darkness is. And people have some, some level of the demonic in their life if they're a non-believer. And so when I think about non-believers, the, the true freedom, the true solution is to have Jesus. So for those non-believers, even if they get prayer from a Christian and get the demons off of them, well, guess what? They're going to come back. You're not safe. You, they're going to invade you again. Hmm. The borders are not secure, so to speak. They'll come right back again and sometimes stronger. You know, so for a non-believer, 
as I did with that, I say, if you really want to be set free, you got to have Jesus. And so I don't do a whole lot of deliverance for non-believers because in the long run, I don't think that's of great benefit because the demons will come right back without knowing Jesus. But with the believer, but what I actually do uh, in, in our church and in, in, my, in our ministry is to do what's called soul care. The demon and inner healing and counselor try to get a picture of how the demons came in and why they're there. And, and usually there's a bigger story involved, you know, some sin, some being sinned against, hmm. some family history, some curses, some occult. It really depends on each person. So each deliverance for me is individual. There's no like a generic solution, but individual. What, but what I would encourage everyone is most deliverance occurs without people knowing about it. There's a great book called Spiritual Warfare Sideways. It's, a, it's not a real well-known book, but it's worth getting. It's written by a man named Guy Chevreau, G-U-I, uh, Chevreau, I think, C-H-E-V-E-R-E. And he looks at the ministry of Heidi Baker and the Spanish ministry in Spain. And the book is about deliverance. And his observation is much of the deliverance in these two ministries occur as people worship and get close to Jesus. Mm. And when I read that, I go, that's it. As you draw near to God, demons cannot stand it and they will voluntarily leave. Wow. And so often when people get into intense worship, and they leave, they feel lighter. You could ask them, like, how was that? Oh, I cried and I feel so light. Mm. Some of that lightness is because the demons left. Wow. You're no longer burdened. So that's what I would encourage everyone. Instead of getting into the details, just draw near to the Lord. Give yourself especially in worship to the Lord. And you'll feel things lift off of you. And you could also just simply ask the Lord for discernment. Lord, please let me know whether I'm struggling with this. The Lord knows best. Yeah. You know. John, for those people who are excited to do some of these things, and uh, maybe some who are still troubled and maybe are doubting, could you just pray for whoever is Amen. watching yeah. on the other side of the screen? I, I would love to. So, so Lord, you know... My story, and you know the stories of those who've encountered your delivering power. So for each and every person watching this who might be struggling in this area, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name for your deliverance. May it come through discernment. May it come through worship. But first, may you encourage every heart that there is freedom on the other end. Freedom for every believer in Jesus who's been harassed, oppressed, even demonized. There is 100% freedom in this area. So I silence the voice of the enemy that would tell them otherwise. I speak against hopelessness despair, and even suicide. And for maybe uh, the non-believers, the few, the non-believers who might be watching this maybe out of curiosity, I just pray, Lord, that you would set them free by having them receive you, Lord Jesus, to encounter you, Jesus. We confess we are living in darkness, in, 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 in heavy darkness, with a lot of confusion, where good is wrong and the wrong is good, left and right. I mean, it's just the language is just replaced with opposite terms. And so we are living in a season of tremendous confusion. But you, Lord, are the Lord of truth and freedom. And so you may, may you speak to every person through this uh, podcast, through this uh, video. Set us free, and we thank you that you are the Lord who sets us free. This we thank in Jesus' name. Amen.